Hey everybody, welcome to eChannel News. We've got uh, Jen Gal. She's a VP of Product Marketing at Ender Labs. And we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of the updates of what's going on with Ender Labs and uh, see what's going on. Uh, Jen, welcome. How are you? Good. Thank you so much, Julian, for having me. How are you doing? Oh, great. Uh, pleasure here. Let's just jump into this. So give us a bit for those who may not remember uh, Ender Labs. So we've got some other interviews we did in the past. So give us a bit of an overview of what uh, Ender Labs uh, brings to the table. Sure. We've been around for about three years now. Uh, we have about 100 employees based globally. And our focus is in software supply chain security, really looking at the open source uh, dependencies that organizations are using to help them secure those dependencies. We're really especially focused for companies that prioritize uh, developer productivity and developer experience, because I think anybody mm -hmm. who's worked in security knows uh, the biggest barrier often to being successful is getting those developers on board. And so we're addressing three major pain points for both digital native and, you know, call them digital immigrant companies, including everyone from, uh, you know, open and AI and Peloton to fortune 500s. We have a top five us bank. We have the Hartford, and then we have lots of startups under our umbrella as well. But we're really hitting uh, three areas that have been challenges, regardless of size or industry. Mm -hmm. So one of those challenges is what we call noise or SCA noise. And so in the industry, your software composition analysis tool is looking for risk in your open source dependencies. And unfortunately, a lot of the tools on the market have extremely high false positive rates. And then when it comes back down to that developer experience, you're sending, you know, perhaps uh, every nine out of 10 alerts are uh, false alarms. And so you start to lose confidence from the developers. Well, we're able to reduce that noise by an average of 92%, making it much more likely that developers will adopt the tool and therefore reduce risks. The other area that we're uh, emerging into this year and really putting a, a big focus on is it's great if you can find the risk, but fixing the risk is the most important thing to everyone. And uh, there's an average in you know, foundational libraries, those that are uh, the applications are highly dependent on that it takes 187 days on average to upgrade those and get rid of risks. And for many organizations, you know, 187 days, let's think about that. That's more than four months. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a lifetime. lifetime. Yeah. And that's just an average. <clears throat> you know, some of the other stats that I've seen is, you know, years. And certainly with customers I've talked to, uh, years is very real for them, that it takes that long to make sure they can make an upgrade without breaking anything. And so that's where, of course, we really want to get into talking today. But uh, we're able to help them get past that 187 days with an 84% faster uh, code fixes. And so they're able to actually meet the SLAs that they might be beholden to. For example, FedRAMP has a 30 day SLA for those criticals. You know, if you're a FedRAMP mm. shop, uh, mm. what sounds better, 30 days or 187? <laughs> And Absolutely. then, of course, compliance acceleration being the last area. We want to make sure that not only are they finding the risks, but they're not losing business because of it. Yeah, I mean, you, you touch on the key things that these businesses are thinking about, right? Because, you know, if you disrupt the, this, uh, the developers, right, everything just slows down. Frustration goes in. And if they start to cut corners or bypass all these, uh, you know, barriers, then you get weird code that goes in there. And who knows? The damage that's going to cause uh, down the road, because if everybody's using open source, and apparently all the the vast majority of apps developers with open source, and then you've got those bad code in there for whatever reason, um, then hey, the whole project is um, doesn't matter anymore, right? Because uh, that's that's where the uh, the bad actors are hoping the vulnerabilities uh, will be. So um, you know, looking at the problem itself, right? Just uh, zooming out a bit. Uh, looking at all the clients that you serve, um, developing various apps for themselves and whatever. Um, what are their ch what are their challenges? What are the problems if they don't go through with something like what Ender Labs bring to the table? Yeah. So as you mentioned, open source is everywhere. Uh, I'm gonna uh, say almost all software contains open source components. There's always going to be that edge case that doesn't have it, but you know, these are components that are developed by the community. 
They're made freely available to everyone. And I'm a big believer in open source. My background before coming to Endor Labs was in that community. And I've seen the, the acceleration that it can offer businesses. You can get to market much, much faster. And there's a recent Harvard study, maybe you've seen it, that uh, it would cost the world $8.8 trillion to develop all open source from scratch. So uh, I wanna be clear here, it's mm -hmm. everywhere and that's a good thing. It's saving us a lot of money. Uh, but the risk comes because you don't control the development life cycle for these components. Mm -hmm. So like any piece of software, open source components can and will become attack vectors through the bugs that just, you know, it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in recognition of this risk, you've got two um, parties, two stakeholders that every organization is probably going to be dealing with. Uh, one of those is their own customers. So anyone who is you know, selling software of any kind is going to have customers that care very much about if that software is healthy, uh, you know, is it going to introduce a, a vulnerability into their ecosystem? And then the other stakeholder uh, is the government, you know, whether it's a local government, whether it's your federal government, um, they have these expectations on both of those stakeholders that you resolve those in a timely manner. And so, uh, you know, for example, CSPs, cloud service providers, they sell to the federal government. That's where they make a lot of money. In order to do that, they have to be FedRAMP certified. So the, the consequence for somebody who's trying to maintain their FedRAMP certification is they could lose it if they're not addressing these, these issues within their software. You know, they have requirements, whether it's FedRAMP or PCI or uh, mm -hmm. the new Cyber Resilience Act that's out in uh, Europe, that they need to be finding the vulnerabilities in a timely manner. So they they aren't necessarily mandating a specific type of tool, but you have to have something in place that's looking for vulnerabilities in your software uh, and you have to fix them in a timely manner. And so depending on the regulation, again, that can be as short as 30 days, that can be as long as 180 days or even longer, but you're typically dealing with short timelines. And Julian, you mentioned early on about the the push and pull with developers and their priorities. And I was, you know, watching back uh, an older interview you did with our CEO and founder, Varun Badwar, where he was talking about a study that said only 30% of their time is used actually writing code. And the other, you know, 70% is doing other things like security. Um, do you really want to be reducing the amount of time that they're writing code? Of course not. You want to be giving that time back to them so that you can meet your business goals. It's just it just seems to me like a critical component of, of development. And and when you factor Jen, like when people do a discovery on apps being used by a company, apparently like half of them are rogue apps or shadow apps, whatever you want to call them. And nobody knows what, what they are. Nobody knows what's in them. And so people need to understand that uh, any app you use, there is a certain amount of risk that's built in. And not because the app is working, it means that it's not, you know, uh, risk-free. Uh, maybe that's the ones that does that does that that has the risk, right? So let's say you're a company and you've got um, all these apps that you're using, um, and and maybe the rogue apps as well. Is there a way that you can go and take a look at those apps and scan them and and give them a bit of a an assessment? Uh, or a risk factor? Do you also do yeah, that? Yeah, so let's let's talk about the problem first, whether you call them a rogue app or a shadow app, where the reality is uh, the older your company is, the more code is in your, your environment that you have no idea where it came from. You don't know who made it, you know, they've moved on uh, and your developers are rightfully terrified to touch it because they don't know if it's going to break or not. Um, finding the code is certainly an issue. Uh, so if you're talking about open source components, the industry standard is what's called software composition analysis or SCA. And what that tool does is it uh, looks through your applications for open source components. So that's the, the first challenge that's in front of everyone is, do I have an SCA tool that can accurately discover what open source I'm using and then correlate it to vulnerabilities? This is where we see the biggest challenges, uh, you know, outside of actually fixing the, the problems is, is that tool accurately discovering? 
-hmm. Most SCA tools use a technique that um, is called manifest scanning. And the way that I like to describe a manifest is it's kind of like the recipe that your software developer wrote for their application. You know, they say, I'm going to use these components and they're going to do these things. And, uh, you know, like a lot of cooks, what actually goes into the final cake might not be in the recipe. And so these manifest scanners, they're scanning this manifest file that has the declared dependencies that may or may not actually be getting used. So that's kind of the core of the issue for many shops is they're using this tool that is making an educated guess. Mm -hmm. We actually take a different approach. This was the problem that Varun and Dimitri founded the company ultimately to solve is let's get accurate pictures of, of your software landscape. And so we take a different approach. We use the company source code as the source of truth, and we actually observe the application at the time it's built. So we can see what is calling what, and we can construct an entire dependency tree that shows how things are interacting with each other. Yeah, it makes, it makes sense. Cause I mean, if you don't know what you don't know, right then you can't secure what you can't see it's game is over right even before it started so so you do the scanning better uh to make sure they, they have a better understanding a better assessment right what's what's in their in their apps and then from there you you, you create the tree so you, you see what's going on with that and then now you discover oh my goodness there's some challenges here right so you identify those things and i'm assuming that they then get the developers to come in there and clean it up uh, so you do you identify the things that they need to be looking at closer 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 we do so we take that um you know full you could call it like a, a chemical analysis of your application instead of using the the recipe to mm -hmm. figure out what's in there so we run our chemical analysis and we say here's everything that's in there and then the second layer that we do is tell you what's actually exploitable because mm -hmm. Uh, what's good about SCA tools is they will give you all of the possible things that could be a risk for you. And this is where it comes back to that noise, those false positives. We don't want to send 100% of that on to developers. We want to send just the items that we can demonstrate are actually exploitable. And so what we do is we look for a connection at the function level. You know, can we take the code your developer wrote and follow its little path? all the way down to the vulnerable library that would be, you know, containing something like log4j in it and establish that, yes, this is exploitable. Uh, we also use EPSS, which is a score around the probability of exploit. And so what we find is when customers combine those two components, that they can reduce the amount of alerts in front of them by up to 98%. And so yeah. that means they just send that 2% over to developers to then actually go ahead and upgrade. Now, this is where, as we talked about at the beginning, there's really the biggest problem happening, you know, in the next horizon in the industry is, okay, you've found all your risk, you know which ones are exploitable, now can you fix them? You know, some components are gonna be a very quick, easy upgrade here, and some are gonna be those weeks or months because we have a deep understanding of how the code is interacting using program analysis and that whole, you know, chemical composition at the time of build, we can actually see what will break if you make an upgrade from, you know, version A to version B or version A to version C. And we can say, this one over here, it's going to fix all the risks you're worried about, and it's going to be a low risk upgrade. It's not going to break anything. So, here you go, development team. Here's an easy one for you. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, we can say, uh oh, uh, there's what's called breaking changes here. And so breaking changes are when something uh, with the, the way that the code interacts with the new version prevents the application from doing what you want it to do. That could be something as simple as introducing, you know, maybe it's a little slower than you expect it to be, or it could be as extreme as congratulations, you just broke production and, <laughs> you know, your, your company's online banking is down. And so we help them see the differences there and where the problems are going to get introduced. Interesting. Because you don't want to be that person. <laughs> That's oh, no, no developer <laughs> wants to be that person. <laughs> um, so is, would it be, would it be fair for me to say as well, that while you're doing this, you're also monitoring the performance of the apps and the, and could you actually you know indicate hey you know what 
your your app is really really slow and clunky because you know you're doing something crazy uh, no we're not monitoring performance so okay. typically application performance is going to come through other channels uh you know in my history of where else I've worked that may be more of a networking like a layer seven networking tool that would tell you that information okay well I just don't want to put a roadmap in front of you uh but there you go so tell me about uh, the Endor magic patches now yeah so we've actually uh recently decided to rebrand uh mm -hmm. rather than Endor magic patches they're Endor patches and uh the reason for that being is there is honestly no magic involved there's no AI involved this is very simple and straightforward and what we were finding as we were talking about it is the word magic kind of gave people the wrong impression and so what an endor patch is, is put in very simple terms is we take the security fix in the current version of an open source component and we backport it to the version that you're using now why does that matter older versions of open source just like any other product they have a you know a cutoff for maintenance you know typically when you you have a contract you're expecting okay if i'm on versions x through z i can expect you know bug fixes and security fixes and things like that and you know with older versions you're not always going to get to do that and that's uh, an encouragement to upgrade well open source is the same way older versions don't always have the security fixes ported back to them so that they can be used no matter what version you're using. And so we take those fixes that are created by the software maintainers and we move them back to the versions that our customers are using. And the reason that we do that is because often with these really complicated upgrades, we'll use the example of a, a framework known very well, it's called Spring. Uh, it can literally take years to upgrade it because there are foundational changes. All we want to do is take the security part and put that back on that older version so that they can make that upgrade on the timeline that they have instead of, you know, for example, that 30 day Fed ramp timeline where they're going to run the risk of breaking everything. Mm -hmm. Well, taking the magic out of it, you know, but it's really hard work. You know, people it like to use the work. Yeah. Yeah, it's not really magic. Um, I leave you, I'll leave you with the last word, Jen. What else do you want um, the channel community to know? And, um, and how do they reach uh, Ender Labs? Yeah, so uh, what I would love for the channel community to know is that uh, we consider the channel our first option for going to market. We know the value of the relationships that they bring and the uh, opportunity for them to represent their customers' needs in finding the best solution. And so if, uh, you know, speaking to you channel partners, if you're having challenges with um, your customers not being able to meet those SLAs, uh, either based on customer expectations or uh, on something like FedRAMP, then definitely uh, reach out to us. We would love to, to go to market with you. And then I'll share a link uh, in the chat or we'll put it in the, the blog for how you yeah. can get in contact with us. There you go. So well, look, every MSB out there, all your clients have gazillions of software. And um, that could be the weakest link. And um, you want to have a conversation uh, with your customers about like what's in your software, uh, what's lurking in your, your software you might want to add, and uh, and then get someone who can actually help you figure all that stuff out. So um, sounds fantastic, uh, Jen. Um, Ender Labs, uh, keep us posted how things are coming along and all the best and keep up the great work. Would Cheers. love to. Thank you. And thanks so much for your time. Pleasure.